All righty. Why don't we stand for the reading of God's Word? We're in Galatians chapter 3. It says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For... The just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. May God bless the reading of His Word. Amen. Lord, We give thanks and praise to you that we have this time in your scriptures. I pray that you help me to set forth that which you've given me to declare, that you give people ears to hear, that it causes each one to desire to dig deeper into your word and to read it regularly throughout the week in their daily lives. Lord, I just ask and pray, most of all, that your Holy Spirit of truth be making people understand more clearly just how great of salvation this is through your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask for these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. You could be seated. Paul begins chapter 3 here once again declaring how shocked he is at the Galatians being duped and deluded by the Judaizers. He says right out of the gate here in chapter 3, O foolish Galatians, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth. Amen. He expressed this shock and amazement, you might recall, earlier in the book, back in chapter 1, verse 6. Remember what he said there? He bypassed the usual saying nice things like he usually does in his epistles to whoever he's writing to. Just does his greeting, bypasses saying the nice thing, and immediately launches into very dire language. And he says, I marvel that you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel. Again, dire language is used here in chapter 3, verse 1, where he again expresses his amazement at their going after the false teaching of the Judaizers. He uses the word foolish in regards to the Galatians. The Greek word Paul employs here is not moros, which speaks of mental deficiency, but anatos, which speaks of one who is able to think, but fails to use proper perception. He is shocked and amazed at how they've been duped and deluded by these false teachers called the Judaizers. He uses another strong word here. He says, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? Who has deluded you? Who has deceived you? Who has duped you? Very dire language. He's trying to get their attention. It is as though they're under a spell by these Judaizers. He uses this dire language because their very salvation was in jeopardy. If they continued to believe the false teaching of the Judaizers, their very salvation was in jeopardy. False teachers, these Judaizers were teaching them that one obtains right standing with God 
through Jesus plus circumcision. They were teaching them that Christ alone was not sufficient for right standing with God, for being able to meet with Him and commune with Him. They were saying it was Jesus plus circumcision. That doesn't mean that this portion of Scripture has no application to us today just because no one's running around in our day saying you need Jesus plus circumcision for right standing with God. We draw out the principle and we apply that to our lives. And the principle is anything we want to add to the finished work of Jesus Christ is wrong. Jesus plus anything we want to add to the finished work of Jesus Christ is wrong. Our sole means of salvation is through Christ alone. Our sole means whereby we can meet with the Father, whether we've been a Christian for five seconds or 55 years, is through Christ. And that's important for us to remember. Now, Paul had so thoroughly and properly preached this truth to them, that it's through Christ alone, that their only hope for salvation was through Christ, based upon his finished work at the cross, that he concludes verse 1 by saying this, Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. Before whose eyes Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. He's talking about here the fact that he had so thoroughly taught them and they so thoroughly understood how important the atonement of Christ at Calvary was for their salvation. It was as if Jesus had been crucified right in front of them. Like the Greek carries the connotation publicly, on like on a billboard. <laughs> That's how rightly and thoroughly he had taught it and how perfectly they understood it upon his departure. And now this. Now they're believing this false teaching of these Judaizers. He's stunned and shocked that they have gone after these men. Now, in verse 2, he says, This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The question Paul asks here in verse 2, Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Is answered in verse 14. Look at the end of this passage of Scripture. Verse 13 says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, talking about our redemption. And then he says this, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So the answer is in verse 14 regarding his question in verse 2. And the answer is, it doesn't come through the works of the law. It comes through the hearing of faith. By the fact, simple fact that you believe in Jesus Christ, you receive the gift. You receive the Holy Spirit into your life. Amen? Very important. Verses 3 through 13 show us how Paul got to that conclusion. In these verses, verses 3 to 13, Paul goes head to head with the false teaching of the Judaizers and repudiates to the Galatians the nonsense the Judaizers have been feeding them. So let's go through here and look at verses 3 through 13 to get to our conclusion at verse 14. He says here in verse 3, he asks more questions. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? They had received the Spirit upon faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? And he's saying, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? Are you going to complete your walk? Are you going to live for God, serve Him based on the works of the law, by the energy of your own flesh? It's ridiculous. Verse 4, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it is in vain? We do not know historically what Paul was referring to about their suffering. But they must have suffered some things in the past that he's referencing, obviously. Perhaps they had suffered for remaining true to the gospel before giving into it like they had now. Paul does reference the fact that he suffers for being true to the gospel 
right here in the book of Galatians. Look at chapter 6, verse 12. Chapter 6, verse 12. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. What he's saying is, if you go along with the circumcision crowd, you'll quit suffering persecution from them. Look what he says back in chapter 5, verse 11. And I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, which he doesn't, why do I still suffer persecution? Then the offense of the cross has ceased. So it may have been, when he's referencing their suffering here in chapter 3, verse 4, may have been the fact that they had suffered for remaining true to the gospel for some time, but now they've given in. So he's saying to them, have you suffered so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Why does he say, if indeed it was in vain? He's still hopeful he can recover them from the error of their ways. He's still hopeful that they won't continue on in the false teaching of the Judaizers and shipwreck their faith. So he goes on in verse 5 and he says, Therefore he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith? Pretty much the same question again that he had in verse 2 about receiving the Spirit or being supplied the Spirit. Is it through faith or through works? How did you get the Spirit? In verse 2, he uses the past tense talking about their initial salvation. In verse 5, he uses the present participle showing the continued work of the Spirit in the Christian's life. He's trying to get them to see. You're going off course. I have explained it to you how it all works and you've decided to throw it aside and follow after these false teachers. All these questions in verses 1 through 5 and then Paul starts giving the answers finally. All these rhetorical questions in verses 1 through 5 And now, finally, starting in verses 6 and 7, Paul starts giving the answer. And the answer is, you receive the Spirit through faith, not through the works of the law or through the works of the flesh. The answer is that, and here in verses 6 and 7, Paul slams the Judaizers hard by destroying the very foundation of their false teaching. Watch how he totally guts and annihilates the Judaizers' false teaching in these two short little verses, verse 6 and 7. Here's what it reads. Just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. The Judaizers... We're teaching the Galatians that it was through circumcision that Abraham obtained right standing with God. And therefore, the Galatians needed to be circumcised in order to become one of the sons of Abraham, showing they too were in right standing with God. That's what the Judaizers were teaching. That circumcision showed that you were with right standing with God. But Paul says something totally different here in verses 6 and 7 than what the Judaizers were teaching. Paul quotes Genesis 15, 6, which says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. And then he concludes in verse 7, Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. Paul totally annihilates the teaching of the Judaizers in one fell swoop. In these two little verses, because of the fact that faith as he is pointing out, came before circumcision. And that when it came, faith, Abraham's faith in God's message, that was when Abraham had right standing with God. That was what God counted as righteous. Amen? Okay. Paul makes clear from Scripture that Abraham's faith gave him righteousness or right standing with God. Circumcision was never even mentioned by God until two chapters later in Genesis 17. Mark that down. Paul quotes Genesis 15, 
showing that Abraham was accounted righteousness from God based on his faith, which is two chapters before Genesis 17, which ever finally begins to speak about circumcision. Hence, what makes you a son of Abraham is not your being circumcised, as the Judaizers are teaching, rather, it's your faith. That's what Paul's saying to them. Verse 7, therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. So, in these two short verses, Paul completely annihilates and guts the Judaizers' false teaching to the Galatians. Pretty remarkable, eh? That is pretty remarkable. In verses 8 and 9, the Scripture says, And the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Verse 8 is a quote from Genesis 12, 3. Paul's point is that all the nations or the Gentiles shall be blessed in Abraham, i.e., you Galatians. You receive the blessing of Abraham by faith. Amen? Not by being circumcised. Would to God that all false teachings would be this easy to repudiate and refute. Wouldn't that be nice? He has gutted everything the Judaizers have been teaching them in these short few verses, directly annihilating it. You are blessed in Abraham not because of being circumcised or not, but because of your faith in Jesus Christ, as he says in verse 9. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with believing Abraham. Not with circumcised Abraham, with believing Abraham. What he quoted there in verse 8 was found back in Genesis 12:3 that all the nations would be blessed in Abraham long before circumcision was ever talked about in chapter 17. Do you understand how important this is? Now, you might be thinking, well, these Galatians, they were Gentiles. How would they know all this Hebrew history? Because this is what the Judaizers were teaching them was this Hebrew history perverting it to their own end, trying to get them to get circumcised. So here's Paul using the same Hebrew history, the same biblical history, to get them to see that what they're teaching is garbage. In verse 10 he says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. He's letting them know if you want to go with the Judaizers, you're placing yourself under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law, to do them. What Paul is saying here is that if you try to relate with God on the basis of keeping the law, you put yourself under the curse of the law. If you try to relate with God on the basis of Jesus plus your goodness, you put yourself under the curse of the law. What is the curse of the law? The fact that no one can keep it perfectly. We all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. Why are you cursed if you try and relate with God on the basis of the law? Why are you cursed if you try to relate with God on the basis of the law? Because once you fail in just one point, you can no longer meet with God. You are cut off from Him. As it says here, Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do that. Once you want to try trying to relate with God on the basis of Jesus plus your goodness, once you mess up, you can no longer meet with Him on that basis. You've put yourself. You can't meet with God. That's a horrible position to be in. Even the Judaizers, who were teaching the Galatians <clears throat> to try and relate with God on the basis of the law, didn't keep all the law perfectly. Paul makes sure he points that out to the Galatians in chapter 6, verse 13. Turn there. Galatians chapter 6, verse 13. He says, For not even those who are circumcised keep the law. 
these Judaizers who are trying to get you into this nonsense, into this false teaching, not even do they keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Okay? So Paul makes it clear, these dudes who are trying to bring you into this false teaching, they don't even keep all the law perfectly. Because no man can. That's biblical fact. Amen? And this is the greatness of the Gospel. That God has made a means whereby we can meet with Him. And it's through Jesus. Period. It's through Jesus plus nothing. Always only. Whether you've been a Christian for five seconds, 55 years, always only through Jesus do you get to meet with the Father. It's extremely important that we remember that. In verse 11, Paul goes on and says, but that no one, no one is justified by the law. Why? Why is no one justified by the law? Because we've all sinned. We all fall short of the glory of God. No one can keep His law perfectly, consistently. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. It's a quote out of Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. It is the verse that changed Martin Luther and brought about the Reformation in Europe, restored to what was understood by Scripture and the early church, justification by faith through Jesus Christ alone. Amen? This was the very verse that radically socked Martin Luther in the head and he saw as he was climbing up the cathedral staircase on his knees trying to find right standing with God through his works, he realized how wrong it all was. That he could never be good enough for God. That the only way he could ever be accepted of God was through his faith in Jesus. The just shall live by faith. What he's saying here is if you try to relate with God on the basis of the law, you will die. Spiritually, you will die. But if you relate with God on the basis of faith in His Son, you will live. Literally live spiritually. And it's important for us to understand that. So many people put themselves under the curse of the law. They kneel before God and they say, Father, I come before you through faith in Jesus. But in the back of the mind, their mind, they're telling up how good they have or have not been. They're not truly coming before Him through faith in Jesus. They're coming before Him through faith in Jesus plus themselves. Jesus plus something I've done. That's abhorrent to the grace of God. What did we say in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29 last week? If you do that, Hebrews 10.29 applies to you. How much worse punishment do you suppose will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? If you try to approach God on the basis of Jesus plus something you've added, verse 29 applies to you. You've trampled underfoot the Son of God. You've declared the blood of the covenant to be a common thing and you've insulted the Spirit of grace. God's righteous judgment stands for you. He judges His people. Very important for us to understand. This is our sole approach to God. It's through faith in Jesus Christ. But that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith. Duh. But the man who does them shall live by them. The man who decides he wants to live that way has to keep it all consistently, perfectly in order to keep his relationship with God, to meet with Him. And the truth of Scripture is repeatedly clear. No man has ever done it. No man is doing it. No man will ever accomplish it. Plain and simple. We are wicked. We are in need of a Savior. His name is Jesus Christ. He is our only hope for salvation. It's Jesus plus nothing that gives us right standing with God. If you don't like that fact, if you can't accept that fact, then you've never really seen just how sinful you are. 
When you understand, when the Holy Spirit convicts you of sin, righteousness, and judgment, and you get a clear look at just what a wicked, evil person you are, then you understand how great of a salvation this is. That Jesus, while we were yet sinners, loved us, died for us, so that if we'll turn from our sin and believe in Him, He will forgive us. That was the most awesome thing I realized when God was convicting me of my sin, showing me I was a sinner. I had burned down people's houses, robbed people at knife point, broke into countless homes, fornicated, did drugs, sold drugs, lived like a filthy dog. I didn't think there was a soul on the earth that loved me. I hated myself. The only one I think might have loved me was my mother. And here, as God was convicting me and showing me that I was a filthy dog and I realized it for the first time in my life, because up to that point, I still would have told you I'm a pretty good person. (laughs) I'm a pretty good person. The thing that arrested my heart the most was His love for me. That He loved me. This is a great salvation. I didn't think anyone on the planet loved me. I didn't love myself. And the God of the universe, the God of the Bible loved me. He communicated His love to me. But I only understood it once I understood what a wicked dog I was. And that's important. We have a messed up Christianity today that wants to bypass the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't want to talk about God's wrath, our guilt before Him, the need to repent. Just wants to talk about answer. You know, about believe in Jesus. Ask Him into your heart. And they make false converts and create huge congregations that make up false churches. And they're all walking around in the darkness, feeling around, blind, destroying people's lives making twofold children of hell. When you truly understand how wicked you are, then you'll truly understand how great of a salvation this is and how it's always only through Christ that you have any hope of salvation with the Father. In verses 13 and 14, Paul goes on to declare the good news. The answer to his question back in verse 2. This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And here's the answer. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. So Paul went through all this annihilating the Judaizers' false teaching to get to the answer of whether it's through the works of the law or the hearing of faith. Brothers and sisters, it's through faith. Because of our faith in Jesus, based upon what He did when He hung on that tree, when He died on that cross, God forgives us of our sins, accepts us as righteous in His sight, and gives us His Spirit. Supplies us His Spirit. We receive His Spirit. Amen? The Spirit radically regenerates us, transforms us. You actually want to read the Bible once you know Him. You want to tell others about Jesus once you know Him. The Spirit is the agent who enables you to live a Christian life, to do good deeds, to demonstrate holy character in your lives. That's extremely important to understand. And the only reason we have the Spirit is because of our faith in Jesus based upon His redemptive work at Calvary. Praise His holy name. Christ died in our stead. He fulfilled the righteous requirement of the law. The wages of sin is death. And He died in our place. So that if we believe in Him, we can obtain forgiveness of our sins, right standing or righteousness with God, and then receive the promise of the Spirit. We do not relate with God on the basis of the law, but on the basis of His mercy found in Christ. Remember Colossians chapter 2, talking about Jesus being a curse hanging on the tree? Look what it says in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, about Jesus hanging on that tree. And you, 
being dead in your trespasses in the uncircumcision of your flesh, the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. What he's saying is, they're against us, and not that the law of God is bad, but that man's incapable of keeping it. When the Bible talks about how we're not under the law, it's not saying that the law of God has no place in life or the Christian's life. It's talking about the fact that we do not relate with God on the basis of law. Okay? Christ has wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. He is our substitutionary propitiatory work at Calvary. What he did there was on our behalf. We should have been put to death for our sins. He died in our stead so that if we believe in him, God forgives us and accepts us, imputes his righteousness to us, accepts us as righteous in his sight. This is an awesome, great salvation. Notice it says here in verse 13 that Christ has redeemed us. That word redeemed, means to buy out of slavery. What were we slaves to? Sin. We've been bought out of slavery through Christ. We were slaves to sin, but Christ has brought us back to God, not with or through corruptible things like silver and gold, but with His precious blood. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. Anybody here guilty of aimless conduct before you came to know Christ? Yeah, bouncing off the walls of sin like a ding-dong. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. What were you redeemed with? The precious blood of Christ is of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Christ redeemed us through the blood which He shed at Calvary. This is a great salvation. Look what was said in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Turn there. Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Therefore take heed to yourselves, this is Paul speaking, and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. We have been redeemed with the blood of Christ. How dare we think that we can add to that through some goodness of our own? Spare me. We must be totally dependent upon His mercy for right standing with God. He died at Calvary, shed His blood there to purchase us to the Father. To bring us into right standing with God. And we think we can add something to that. Be it circumcision. Be it the blood of bulls and goats. Be it you make your own little list of do's and don'ts and you try to keep it. And if you keep it, you think, ah, God really accepts me now. That's all garbage. You can only meet with God through Jesus. Period. Look at Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Everywhere you look in the New Testament where it talks about redemption, about us being redeemed, it always points to the blatant C-spot run fact that we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. Nothing else is ever mentioned. Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. You get a picture into heaven. And it says, and they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. 
every time the Scriptures talk about us being redeemed or redemption, it points to Jesus' shed blood, His work at Calvary alone, which brings us that redemption that redeems us to God. And notice it's out of every tribe, tongue, people, and nation, and have made us kings and priests to God, and we shall reign on the earth. Bless His holy name. Amen? This is a great salvation. We have been redeemed through Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, don't try to add to the finished work of Christ. When you meet with the Father in prayer, enter in only through the means which He has provided, which is found through His Son, Jesus, plus nothing. Hallelujah. Let's stand up. We'll have a word of prayer. Hallelujah, Father. Lord, we thank You for this time that we had in Your Word this morning that we can go through this book, that You preserved it so that we can know Your words, know Your ways and Your thoughts, not wonder or have doubt, but be sure through the Scriptures. Lord, I just ask and pray that You would bless what was preached here and use it for good. Bless it to the heart and mind of each one present. May they understand these things greater as they read these verses over again this week. Lord, I ask and pray that they would be a help to other Christians in explaining just how great of a gospel this is. Lord, we give thanks, we give praise to You that You have redeemed us. Lord, when we were walking about in darkness, in our sin and selfishness, O Lord, in Your mercy, You loved us. Your Holy Spirit convicted us showing us of our need for Your Son, Jesus, that You wonderfully regenerated us, translated us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of Your Son. Lord, I just ask and pray that we would be Your faithful servants in the earth, not squandering our days on our selfish pursuits, our own ambitions, but that we put our faces low to the ground, seek Your face, and do that which You desire, O God. Lord, show us what You desire from our lives, both in the plain reading of Your Word and also by the leading of Your Spirit regarding our individual lives, O Lord. As You give gifts to the, to the body and use the body of Christ in different ways that it might be strengthened as a whole. Praise Your holy name, O God. We rejoice in You, O Lord. May we be hungry for Your Word, desirous to pray, to worship You, Right in the workplace this week, O God, may we beseech You in prayer. Right in the workplace, may we just sing out a song of worship to You, regardless of who's around. Lord, I just ask and pray that our hearts would be enthralled with You, full of love for You, O Lord. We look to You to do it within us, O God, for You are the vine, we are the branches. We can do nothing without You. We are utterly dependent upon You. Glorify Yourself through our lives. Use these vessels of clay to Your glory and honor, we pray. And we ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. We're going to take communion at this time. I believe we have communion, yep. And uh, we take communion every week at Mercy Seat. We do that for a number of reasons. One, it's the tradition of the church to observe His table each week. We follow in that blueprint laid out by the early church, that pattern. And we, too, observe his table every week here at Mercy Seat. You can feel free to take communion with us as long as you're a Christian. If you've repented and believed in Christ, feel free to take communion with us. If you're not a Christian, we ask that you not take communion. The Lord's table is for believers to observe only. Okay? The Apostle Paul wrote, of the Lord's table in 1 Corinthians 11. And he said, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death, talking about his finished work at Calvary, 
You proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Even our time at the Lord's table affirms and supports everything I just preached about in the book of Galatians. Amen? Because at his table, there's only two elements. The bread, representing Christ's body, and the fruit of the vine, representing his blood, and absolutely nothing else. Amen? Pointing to the fact that it's through Christ alone that we have right standing with God. At his table are not these two elements, plus a list of how many good deeds I've done or how many hours I've spent in prayer. Only these two elements are at his table, signifying that's our approach to God. It's through Christ. We cannot think it's through Jesus plus those good things I do. The good things that we do are the result or the evidence or the fruit of our saving faith in Jesus. We do those good things not to try and obtain God's acceptance. Rather, we do them because we have obtained God's acceptance. And there's a huge distinction between the two. Very important for us to remember. And this time at his table reminds us of that important faith. That our our means to meeting with the Father is through Jesus plus nothing. These are the only two elements at his table signifying his sole approach to the Father is through Christ, his Son. Why don't we bow our heads and we'll have a word of prayer, and then we'll partake at the Lord's table together. God, we rejoice in you, and we thank you that you have redeemed us, and we thank you that we have this time at your table to remember this great salvation through your Son, Jesus. I ask and pray, O Lord, that we would be your faithful ambassadors in the earth, and that we would make your holy law And this great salvation, which we celebrate now, known to the men of our nation. May we not sit in silence. May we not sit in cowardice or out of concern for reputation. May we not sit in silence. May we be your faithful witnesses in the earth, declaring to others your holy law and this great salvation through your son, Jesus. Lord, may we look for opportunities to do that. Lord, may we boldly create it being done and just declare to people what they need to hear. Lord, not even just waiting for a little window to open. Lord, may we push the window open, even as you taught us to go forth and to preach the gospel unto every creature. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you. We thank you that you have redeemed us. Our lives were without meaning aimless in conduct, with no purpose at all, when we did not know you. Now that we know you, O God, we know why we're here. And that is to live, to glorify you, and to enjoy you forever, through and in our lives. Lord, I just ask and pray that you would be glorified through each one here this coming week. May they even be astounded how you use them in the lives of others. And I ask these things in Things in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Let's partake together. Glory and honor unto you. Praise your holy name. Lord, I ask and pray that you'd be with each one here, that you watch over them and keep them this week. Use them for your purposes in the earth to glorify your name, to see your kingdom expanded. Lord, I ask and pray that each man here would be a priest to his home and that he would open your word to his wife and to his children and instruct them from it this coming week. Pray that each woman would be a helpmate to her husband. Nurture of the children an anchor in the home, O oh God. So needed. Lord, I ask and pray that each child would be a blessing in the home, honoring their mother and their father, that each single person would use their time to bring glory to you, not frittering it away, that each young person, O God, would use their strength to the glory of your name and not waste it on selfish ambition. Lord, we give thanks and praise to you. We pray for the elderly amongst us. All the grandparents, the great-grandparents, ask that they would be an example of holy living to their progeny, O God. That they would sit down with their children, their grandchildren, their great-grandchildren, and talk to them about the things of you, O God. 
leaving that lasting impact upon young lives. Lord, we rejoice in you and thank you for all you're doing in our lives and all you've done. Hallelujah, God. Lord, this culture is a mess. Even your church is a disaster. Help us to live true to you in all areas of life. May we see that your rule impacts every area of our lives and every area of life. And I ask these things in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Praise his holy name. God bless you.